From A Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux. Gondor, Heavy Infantry Kit Review. This is actually a neat kit review to pick up with after the last one, since this is essentially a more successful effort to construct a fantasy panoply for a plate-armored common infantryman. Today, we're looking at the Gondor Heavy Infantry from Peter Jackson's Adaptation of Return of the King. Compared to the Lannister armor from last time, Gondor's kit actually borrows slightly less of its concept from historical exemplars, but makes up for it with a much more capable execution. As a special bonus, because I love Tolkien, we'll also briefly compare the armor of the film to what is described in the books at the end. If this is your first kit review, how this works is that we're first going to look at the possible historical models for the overall kit, the historical basis, which will give us some grounds for comparison. Then, we'll look at armor, weapons, and other equipment. Historical Basis As with the Lannister Infantry, the closest parallel to the general equipment of the Gondor Heavy Infantrymen, distinct here from the lighter rangers, who we may discuss at another time, are late medieval or early modern infantrymen armored with the Almain Rivet, discussed in more detail here. We'll talk about how well that style of armor is recreated in the films in a moment. One area where the concept of the infantrymen of Gondor fares much better is how this military system relates to the society that spawns it. One lesson I drill into my students when teaching military topics is relevant here. Every army is a battlefield instantiation of the society that created it. Armies almost always deeply reflect the peacetime organization of their societies, replicating structures of power, class divisions, gender expectations, racial or citizenship categories, and so on. They cannot help but replicate these systems. To return briefly to the last kit review, this was one of the failures of the Lannister army concept. While we were repeatedly told that structure of Westerlin society under the Lannisters was based in the considerable power of individual families, in a nested system of vassalage, these men were absent in the actual organization of the army, which instead favored disciplined masses of well-trained peasants who were themselves completely left out of the structures of power in society. The army simply did not reflect the society which supposedly spawned it. Aside, just so there is no confusion, there are actually a number of ways a society can be organized to get large numbers of commoners into the army as well-trained infantry, not all of which require giving those commoners a political voice, but all of which require integrating them into political structures, for instance, into administrative and tax structures. The issue with many fantasy worlds, for example Westeros, is they do neither. Instead, constructing a political system where the commoners who evidently make up the most important part of the army have neither a political voice, political stake, or meaningful integration into the structures of state power. The Lord of the Rings films provide only hints of the political structure of the Kingdom of Gondor, but what we see suggests a society far more likely to be able to put together this sort of army. The government seems to be strongly centralized under the stewards, in contrast to the society of Westeros, which holds the small folk who make up their infantry in unveiled contempt. Gandalf's declaration to the gate guard that they remember they are soldiers of Gondor who will thus stand their ground at all costs, implies considerable social investment in these men. For that statement to have any motivating value, it must matter that these men are soldiers of Gondor. That must be an honored position. And it quite evidently is. Image. Soldiers of Gondor locking shields and lowering spears. Image description. You are soldiers of Gondor. No matter what comes through that gate, you will stand your ground. These men are being charged by trolls 
and their response is to lock shields and lower spears. This is the sort of action that we use the term cohesion to describe. This unit may win, or it may lose, but it will hold together. Soldiers of Gondor, indeed. End of image description. Expanding for a moment to the books, we see more indications that this is the case. While Gondor, like all societies, has its aristocrats, the contingents that arrive to defend Minas Tirith are mostly counted by the towns and regions they come from. The men of Lassernach, men of the Ringlow Vale, fisher folks of the Etir, and so on, rather than by what lord or noble has organized them. Return of the King, 46. Likewise, Aragorn arrives to the battle, quote, leading a great valor of the folk of Lebanon and Lamadon, end quote. 135. That's not to say that there is no feudal language in the text. Local aristocrats also figure into these reports. This is not a standing professional army, but the men evidently matter as much in the reporting as the aristocrats who lead them. At the same time, this army is distinctly provincial. Where each contingent of men is from matters. And the army is broken down along these lines, not only in its accounting, but evidently in its leadership structure. Note that each of the regional contingents normally has its own leader. Image. Map of Gondor showing its regions. Image description. A map of Gondor showing its regions from the Lord of the Rings Project.com. End of image description. What Gondor absolutely does not have is a system built around mounted, heavy horse. Only one region of Gondor maintains a significant number of heavy horsemen, Dal Amroth. Instead, Gondor has invested in its infantry, and we are in fact told, quite bluntly, that, quote, the people of the city used horses very little, end quote, and, quote, have less skill with horses than some. End quote. Return of the King, 2434. While the aristocrats of Gondor ride into battle, as with Faramir and Prince Imrahil, quite evidently Gondor has not made the same investment into a system of aristocratic heavy horse warriors that the societies of much of medieval Europe, or of Westeros, did. Instead, it has placed the burden of importance on the infantrymen, while the value of military aristocrats lies not in their own martial prowess, but in their leadership ability. For a quick and readable overview of the heavy horse system, especially as a matter of social emphasis rather than strictly a matter of technology or battlefield expedience, Chapter 5 of Lee, Waging War, 2016, offers a good introduction with some solid bibliography for pursuing the issues further. I think Tolkien is drawing on two main systems for this form of army, the Anglo-Saxon Fjord and the Byzantine Theme. In brief, the Fjord system was established under Alfred the Great, King of Wessex in England. It was active from roughly 878 to 1066 CE. The kingdom was divided into 33 regions. Each region, through its local aristocrats, was able to raise a local force to defend itself, a regional levy, the Fjord and collect taxes with which the king maintained a centralized professional force, the housecarls, the men of the king's house, literally house men. For a major army, the fjords would be called upon to contribute troops, mainly infantry, to the main army. The resulting force contained a large body of amateur infantry arranged in a shield and spear wall, along with a core force of professionals set about the king. Image. Anglo-Saxon Infantry from the Bayou Tapestry Image Description From the Bayou Tapestry Anglo-Saxon Infantry at the Battle of Hastings, 1066 These are probably meant to be elite Huscarls rather than the Fjordmen, but it still gives a sense of a society that has invested in building a cohesive infantry force. End of Image Description the Thym system, established by the Byzantines in the mid-7th century, and active for centuries thereafter, was actually a somewhat very similar system, but on a significantly larger scale, see the map below, and in a wealthier, more densely populated region. 
In each thymen, the army consisted of semi-professional soldiers. Fighting was their job, but they were given plots of state-owned land to support themselves as farmers in peacetime. This thyme army, called a thyme or thyme, provided a continually present local defense force, which was ideal for countering sudden raids. Those armies came to also define the administrative units to the empire, such that the themes were essentially provinces as well. Image. Map of the Byzantine Themata. Image description. Via Wikipedia. A map of the Byzantine Themis system in 1025. End of image description. At the same time, a large, fully professional army was maintained at the capital, the Tagmata. In the event of a major invasion, this army would move out to the problem area, collecting the armies of the Themes as it went. We've actually already discussed how the Byzantine beacon system, almost identical to the beacons of Gondor, fit into this system. So the inspiration to Gondor's military system is fairly clear. What is important to stress in both systems is how the class of people who provide the infantry are integrated into political systems. Taking just England as an example, constructing the system of fortified towns, burrs, which anchored the Fjord system, required fairly intensive administration of the English countryside. Land ownership had to be counted and tracked because military service depended on it. That administrative system, largely maintained by later Norman kings, was one of the reasons that England remained an uncommonly well-administered kingdom through much of the Middle Ages. One complete English survey, the Domes de Book, dating to 1086, survives to the present day. It is a unique and fantastic document, and a large part of the reason we know so much more about the English countryside than many contemporary areas. Likewise, both societies valued the military service done under these systems. This is an element of the development of military systems which is easy for students and experts alike to miss. The value a society places on a given arm of the army is a major determinant of how effective it will be, both because it determines how heavily the society will invest resources in that arm, but also because of how it impacts the mindset of the troops in question. Soldiers who believe they are valuable and valued elements of the army who think their survival and effectiveness are important and have been invested in will tend to fight better. Getting back to what we talked about with the Unsullied, this social investment is another way to build that all-important infantry virtue, cohesion. While neither of these systems survived late enough to be contemporary with the style of armor, the Almain rivet, Gondorian soldiers wear, it's not hard to imagine, at least, the professional core of these systems being so equipped. Where the film falls down a bit in representing a system like this, and breaks with the books, the movies have removed the lower quality regional troops, which are quite in evidence in the books. For example, Return of the King 46, in order to make the entire army uniform. It's always unfortunate to see the chance for visual storytelling like this lost. But I can understand, given the incredible range of props required for the film, the desire to keep the number of armor types down. Armor. Part of the reason I spent all of that space on the social position of the infantry is that we've already discussed the historical reference point for mass-produced European-style plate armor for infantry, the Almain Rivet. I don't want to get bogged down in repeating everything I said there about these kinds of armors, so you can head back that way to read about the ways in which I felt that while Game of Thrones Lannister infantry armor was clearly modeled on the Almain Rivet, it didn't capture the form or function of it well. Lord of the Rings Gondorian armor is quite a bit more successful. There are some problems with it, but it is quite a bit better than par for film and TV armors. Image. Suit of 16th century Almain Rivet armor. Image description. Via Wikipedia, an example of 16th century Almain Rivet armor, with its relatively simple design. Note how the pauldrons remain relatively flat, and also the ridges at the top of the breastplate and the gorget, the separate neck protection here, 
to prevent a strike from riding up into the neck. End of image description. There is some variance scene to scene, but generally, the armor consists of what is sometimes called half plate, worn over what looks to be textile padding, or at least a Hollywood outfit similar enough for us to assume, and male voiders. We'll talk about what those are in a second. Image. Gondorian soldier in armor. Image description. It is quite hard to get a good shot of infantry wearing armor because they're almost never in the center of the frame, facing the camera in well-lit scenes. End of image description. The extent of plate coverage is a breastplate with backplate and tassets covering the upper legs, a pauldron with lames, telescoping metal plates, covering the upper arms, a helmet, and in some cases greaves, protection for the lower legs, and bracers, protection for the lower arms. Not everyone seems to have the latter. As I discussed before, there is a fairly normal, logical sequence to armor, with some exceptions of course, in terms of what part of the body is covered, and this armor largely fits. While traditional European all-main rivet generally didn't include greaves, it's not an implausible addition, especially for shield-bearing infantrymen. The oddity here is the bracers that we sometimes see, ironically for precisely the same reason why I find the greaves eminently reasonable. These men are shield-bearing. This is a nitpick, but I found that generally lower arm protection is less important for soldiers with shields, since their shields protect that part of the body quite well. Some of the Gondor soldiers merely have mail covering their arms, and that seems a touch more likely to me, but this is no great issue. Image. Group of Gondorian soldiers in armor. Image description. Better images of the armor, this time on cavalry, showing the slope of the breastplate, which ought to be more pronounced, and the waist, which ought to be higher, along with the articulated lames of the pauldrons, which are good. End of image description. So, the coverage is more or less right. What about the individual pieces? For the breastplate, I like that it is angled and clearly made out of metal rather than leather or some other material. It isn't perfect though. The breastplate itself, and this is a very common film and game armor mistake, comes too low on the body. European breastplates transition into the fold, a plate or set of plates protecting the hips at the natural waist that is, at the thinnest point in the trunk of the body. You can see that, for instance, here. Image. Diagrams of different breastplates. Image description. 15th and early 16th century armor from E. Okshat's European Weapons and Armor from the Renaissance to the Industrial Revolution, 1980-83. End of image description. That high waist and the bell shape it creates as the breastplate flares out into the fold beneath it allows for greater freedom of movement and actually avoids a problem you can see clearly here. Image. Gondorian soldier in armor being given a flower. Image description. This cavalryman shows the lamas of the pauldron articulating as he lifts his arm, along with the boxy, oversized upper plate. My guess is he can't lift his arm much higher. Also, his male sleeve doesn't cover his armpit, though some of the other soldiers do. I assume this was a costume limitation. Making tons of mail is expensive. End of image description. Notice how the bottom of the cavalryman's breastplate, under the belt, needs a sort of bib shape so that he can still move his legs around? If you waist the armor a bit higher and cover the hips with an articulated fold, you avoid that problem while offering superior protection and mobility. The other issue with the breastplate, to my eyes, is that while it narrows some at the waist, it doesn't narrow enough. Costume designers generally seem allergic to the wasp-waisted shape of most historical breastplates. Now, it is true that some historical armors do not have that wasp waist. Famously, Henry VIII's armor doesn't, because he was quite fat. But most do. That narrow waist aids mobility because it also allows for the curved, technical word globular, shape of the breastplate, which causes strikes to glance off more easily. 
you can see my discussion here and here on armor penetration to see just how powerful sloped armor can be. Image. Henry VIII's Field Armor. Image Description. Henry VIII's Field Armor, mid-16th century from the Met. It is a deeply unattractive armor. I am reminded of Okashat's lament for the armor of the 17th century, which continued in this style. Quote, At the end of the 16th century, all the aesthetic quality went out of armor, as if the craftsmen who made it had lost heart, as indeed they probably had, in view of the dislike and scorn with which it had come to be regarded. The necessity to make armor conform with the short, high-waisted, huge-sleeved doublet and the colossal baggy breeches which followed the later 16th century styles of dress must have been enough to make any self-respecting master armorer throw in the towel. Maybe merely ugly shapeless forms would have been too bad, but the stuff was actually comical. End quote. Okashant, 1980-209. End of image description. Next up the pauldrons, the armor covering the shoulders. I like that they've used articulated lames to allow for lots of shoulder coverage without constraining mobility. My one criticism is the relatively boxy shape of the top plate of the pauldron. This is also a trend in fantasy armor design, which is to create really oversized and boxy or bubble-shaped pauldrons, presumably to make the wearer look like they have huge shoulders, but historical pauldrons, see the Okashat image above, tend to fit much more closely to the shoulder. There are some things I really like. First, the breastplates have a ridge around the neck. I like it, but it should be larger, and ideally complemented by a second ridge lower down, like on the Chotobug Quiris, pictured below. That kind of ridge is important. You don't want a spear point hitting the breastplate and then riding up into your neck. Image. Chittaburg Quiris. Image description. Chittaburg Quiris, 1380. A very early plate Quiris. Note the two metal ridges designed to deflect blows away from the neck. Note there are two Quirises from Chittaburg that sometimes go by the name. This is the older of the two. End of image description. Next. Male Voiders. This armor kit gets bonus points for including what appear to be male voiders, though it could be a full male shirt, beneath the armor, and also on parts of the legs. Now, all main rivet for the common infantry was most often, as far as I can tell, worn without male voiders, because mail was very expensive. But in this context, I think it speaks to both the wealth of Gondor and the investment in the lives of these soldiers that many seem to have that sort of reinforcement, which is absolutely a plausible way to try to up-armor this kind of arsenal plate. They don't always have quite the coverage I'd like. In some cases, they don't cover the armpits, which they should, and there's never a male skirt, which would have been quite useful given the gap the tacits leave over the crotch. Image Gondorian soldier in armor being shot with an arrow. Image description. Note the male voiders covering his arm. It should, but doesn't appear to in this image, also cover his armpits. End of image description. Also, just generally the use of lames properly articulated. This is one place where this kit clearly outperforms something like the Lannister armor which simulated armored lames by just attaching thin sheets of metal to a continuous leather backing. In contrast, as you can see with the cavalry man above, the lames here are fully articulated, as they would have been historically, using leather straps and sliding rivets. One oddity is that it seems like some of the tacits stack top to bottom, and others bottom to top, but this is no issue. My impression is that top to bottom, where the lower lames are inside the upper ones, is more common in Europe, but hardly universal, and that bottom to top seems to me to be more common, for instance, in Japanese armor. Finally, the helmet. Completely plausible. This is essentially a bit of a mix of a barbute, an Italian style of helmet, which may have mimicked the shape of the Greek Corinthian helmet, with the raised crest of something like a kulakud or a turban helmet. In fact, some barbutes have small crests already, although not so prominent as these. But the raised point top to the helmet 
has the same sloped armor effect as we've already discussed with the breastplates, and was a popular design feature in a wide variety of helmets from Europe to China and back again. I find this take eminently reasonable as a fantasy helmet. My only quibble is I'd like to see a helmet liner. We see enough of these helmets on and off of people's heads that we should see a nice, thick padded helmet liner, quilted like a gambeson. You can see some surviving historical examples in the Wallace collection, if you ever head that way. Image, 15th century Italian Barbute. Image description, via Wikipedia, a 15th century Italian Barbute from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. End of image description. Grade A-. minus. The all main rivet is a historical design, and for all of the little flaws, this is a reasonably okay effort at producing one for film. I am offering the costume team here a bit of a break because I understand that they, much like historical arsenals, need to make a lot of these, we are often seeing several dozen on screen at once, cheaply. Still, for an armor that is mostly in the background, the overall effect is solid. Weapons. Leaving aside the archers, each soldier appears to have a spear as a primary weapon, an arming sword as a secondary weapon, and a mid-sized rectangular oval shield held with a strap grip. Individually, I actually am okay with all of these, but collectively, they aren't quite right. The spear looks to be eight, maybe nine feet long, with a long, straight metal blade hafted on it with a traditional metal socket haft coming to a point. The blade looks to be slightly wasted, probably to evoke the design of leaf-bladed swords like Sting. I don't follow why that design feature would be here, but I have seen it in historical examples of what I'm fairly sure is the inspiration, so fair game. I think it's pretty easy to classify this weapon as a Yari, a type of Japanese spear, or even pike for the longer variants, perhaps most famous for its ubiquity as the standard weapon of Ashigaru infantry during the Sengoku Jedi, 1467-1650, though it was used both before and after that period. Image. Tip of a Gondorian Spear. Image Description. Tip of a Gondorian Spear. End of image description. And, it is not a bad imitation of that style. The socket system is different. The Yaris I have seen, admittedly, not a huge number, are hafted with a tang, a section of metal extends down inside of the wooden half, rather than a socket, where the metal of the tip shrouds over the top of the haft, usually being secured by one or more nails or rivets. To be honest, I'm not sure that a socket haft would hold up to the forces on this weapon. That long straight edge lets you cut with this spear as well. In Europe, such hewing spears often have either longer sockets or langets, metal strips running from the tip further down the haft, secured by rivets, to better secure the head. But this is a minor quibble, to be sure. Image. Tips of various Yari. Image description. Via Wikipedia, three Yari, the center one in particular, is quite like the Gondorian spear. End of image description. The problem is that the Yari is a two-handed weapon. So this kit continues a problem seen in the Lannister kit, which is giving the shield and spear infantry spears too large and heavy to be used in one hand. The key problem here is that the blade of these spears is long, a couple of feet at least, and it's going to be heavy, affecting the weight and balance of the weapon. Most hewing spears are for use in two hands, and the Yari is, to my understanding, no exception. Of course, many such weapons can be used in one hand in extremis. The question here is the ideal use of the design. Image. Mass of Gondorian soldiers with shield and spears. Image description. Shields in use. You can also get a clear sense of just how tall those Gondorian spears are here. These would be tough to use in one hand. End of image description. Which brings us to the shield. I actually don't mind this shield design. It is not absurdly sized, appears to be made of wood with an appropriate leather outer layer, painted with a design and what seems to be, or is intended to look like, 
a metal rim at the top and the bottom. Polybius describes Roman shields as being rimmed this way, so that tracks just fine. Polybius, Book 6, Section 23, Line 4. The grip system seems, it's hard to tell, a little off. Using a strap grip system here is fine, but I'd expect a system much like a European heater or kite shield, pictured below. Image. Strap system for a kite shield. Image description. Via Todd's workshop, a replica medieval kite shield showing a historical grip configuration. End of image description. But the main problem is having the shield. These fellows are very heavily armored, and while Peter Jackson thinks you can put an arrow through a steel breastplate, in practice you cannot. Historically speaking, more complete plate protection in most cases led to a steady movement away from shields. Now I want to qualify that. Since not everyone had access to plate protection, shields didn't flee the battlefield completely or right away. Consequently, you can solve two problems with one change in this kit. Drop the shield. Suddenly, the Yari works as a two-handed weapon for use in formation, and the shield no longer reduplicates protection that the armor is already amply providing. And I suppose change the scene of the fellow getting hit by an arrow in the chest to have it hit him in the neck or face. As for the swords, I struggled to get good screenshots of the Gondorian arming swords, but they looked quite serviceable. Some of them have disc pommels and upward curving guards with a central ridge but no fuller, which would make them pretty standard Okashat's 15s. Faramir's sword has an unusual pommel, but it's quite likely a type B, C, or N, following Okashat again, with a bit of an artistic flourish and seems fairly reasonable. Apologies, but I could not get a good screenshot of it. Image Gondorian Soldier with Sword Image Description Sword to the right, showing, barely, the disc pommel and raised, possibly Style 9 in the Okashat's topology, guard. End of Image Description Grade B or B+. Individually, I don't have a huge problem with any of these pieces, but the shield belongs in a different kit from the spear and the armor. Flashy spears with long metal tips typically require both hands. Other Equipment As I've noted in the other kit reviews, TV, film, and video games almost never show soldiers with the amount of additional equipment, food, entrenching tools, tents, cooking supplies, and so on, which they would actually have. Return of the King is, sadly, no exception. While the Fellowship itself, most famously Sam, marches with baggage, although not nearly enough of it, Faramir's rangers have not a backpack or satchel between them when marching through Ithilien. Image. Faramir's rangers on the march. Image description. Uh, hey, Bob. What, Steve? Do you feel like, uh, we've forgotten anything? <sighs> no, Steve. I have my sword and my bow, and my arrows and my cloak, and this hobbit here. What could I have forgotten? I don't know, like all of our stuff? Like the tent, the bedroll, my shovel, your pot, our cups, the food, our water, your dice, my basket, that net, our spare nails and arrowheads, Jim's pick, my shovel, the tent pegs. Crap. End of image description. We get a pair of very short scenes set in camp, in Osgiliath in Return of the King, and at the pool in the Two Towers. We also see some of Osgiliath in the Two Towers as well. The camp in Osgiliath has all of the problems as Ed Sheeran's camp in Game of Thrones, too small, and not enough stuff. We see some cooking tools, some hay, important because they have horses, and a lot of spare weapons, but no tents, and not nearly enough food or other equipment. Osgiliath is large enough that we might assume there is a more permanent encampment, sheltered deeper in the ruins. But Faramir's camp at the pool is much better. In the background of the scenes, we see stockpiled supplies by the crate and sack load, in addition to the usual, and generally excessive, complement of spare weapons. We even see a fair number of Gondorian soldiers stowing supplies in the background. 
Image, Sam and Frodo in Faramir's camp. Image description. Just look at all of that stuff! This army might not starve to death within the next 72 hours. End of image description. I think the real problem here is that a lot of the folks involved in producing this material don't have a good sense of what an army ought to have with it. So at best, they just figure that armies carry lots of weapons and so stack up lots of spare weapons. And that's not necessarily wrong. But spare weapons are a tiny portion of the total baggage of an army. Far more would be carried in food, tools, bedding, and the like. Image. Crates from Faramir's camp. Image description. Look, Mr. Frodo, even more stuff. End of image description. The bar for this category is very low. But at the same time, unlike our previous examples, we only rarely see Gondor soldiers on the march far from home. We get only a very short look at Aragorn's vanguard setting out from Mordor. It is entirely plausible that his baggage train is further back in the army, and would be camped well to the rear of his formation once he reaches the Black Gate. Still, we see no supplies. Grade B-. All told, this still isn't a great showing. But, having even one scene with what appears to be boxes and barrels of provisions puts Lord of the Rings ahead of a fair bit of the competition. Conclusion Overall, I actually really like this kit. There was clearly some care put into getting elements of the armor right and most of the pieces have pretty solid historical models with little deviations like the pointed helmets and the use of a Yari over a European-style spear that felt in place and largely fitting with the design. I feel I should note that these kits are somewhat of a deviation from the books, which note only Imrahil's cavalry from Dal Amroth having full harness, meaning wearing a full harness of plate armor, Return of the King 46. Tolkien's reference points for equipment tend to be earlier in the Middle Ages, where his own expertise was, before the advent of plate armor. Thus, dwarves of Dane's army in The Hobbit, described as, quote, clad in a hauberk of steel mail that hung to his knees, and his legs were covered with hose of a fine and flexible metal mesh, end quote. Hobbit, 276. That kind of protection, a hauberk with mail shows, leg coverings, in this case, made of some ingenious dwarven sort of armor, would have been the gold standard of protection around the year 1000 AD, but hardly impressive by the early 15th century when we start to see full plate harnesses. What there is in the books describing particularly Pippin's armor and the armor of the guards of the Citadel leads me to believe that Tolkien has in mind something like 13th century armor, full male coverage with a surcoat, rather than the 16th century all-main rivet-inspired design we see. But that doesn't bother me all that much, because what I really love about this kit is how it expresses the values of Gondor effectively, in a visual way. Unlike Faramir's elite rangers or the guards of the Citadel, these infantrymen are common soldiers. Nevertheless, Gondor has spent a ton of resources protecting the lives of these individual common soldiers, affording them very strong protection with what appears to be quite high quality armor. Image. Group of Gondorian soldiers in battle. Image description. Pictured. Cohesion. These men are fighting, not running away, even when wildly outnumbered while the city is on fire being attacked by, among other things, supernatural, unkillable wraiths. Soldiers of Gondor, indeed. End of image description. It fits with a society as discussed above, which values these men and their battlefield contribution, and so is willing to devote the resources necessary to preserve them and also ensure maximum effectiveness but it also visually expresses Gondor's problem. This ancient society still clearly has quite a lot of wealth in its vast city of stone, 
but severe manpower problems. Consequently, a material intensive warfare style, heavy infantry and very heavy armor, makes good use of the resources they do have to try to offset the problems in numbers they face. I think, had they gone the strict interpretation route and put basically everyone in mail, these distinctions, especially between Gondor's wealthier society compared to Rohan's poorer one, would have been less clear as a way to express visually things we are told in the text, in the books, I think the armor succeeds quite nicely. Overall grade, A minus, B plus. Despite some minor flaws, the armor works and is believable, made from believable materials. Read Iron and Steel. What keeps this from a higher score is the lack of equipment we see them carrying, and that pesky shield, which really ought to go. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux, recorded by myself, a great divorce, for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms, if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.